I've got a lot to cover for you. You know how I do it, rat-a-tat-tat. I want to leave some time for questions. My PowerPoint will be available through your great organization so you can study it a little bit more. And I'm going to tell you <clears throat> at the beginning, uh, I'm still optimistic on this great country, even though uh, we're, you know, I, I think we're in a ditch right now and, and you know, further digging down. Uh, but I'm still optimistic over the long haul. Uh, <clears throat> I'm always wanting to be as fair and balanced as I possibly can be, but it's getting harder. I will tell you not to be too political right now, but uh, that's my caveat. Now, you, most of you probably think Washington's direction looks confused. It's not. They have taken a hard shift left, and I mean a hard shift. Uh, now we're going to weave through. Now this is from an AgriPulse Farm Journal, uh, AgPulse, you know, survey, and you, this is just agriculture. And you can see this doesn't echo the, about the 49% approval of most Americans on President Biden because in rural countryside, 75% strongly disapprove. Uh, that didn't surprise us at Pro Farmer, but the numbers continuing to show that, okay? And we take that up at least every other month. Uh, you know, we took it through the Trump administration that continued to show the rural sector's vivid support for President Trump, and it wound up being correct. Now, words. I'm a journalist now. Words are very important for me, and I'm already building the Biden administration new dictionary. And I think it's instructive from a policy perspective. The first one is, whoop, you know, the first one is, you know, bipartisan. Now, Biden campaigned on healing the country and being bipartisan, but he's governing partisan. There's no doubt about it. Another word, equity. It used to be the term they used was inequality. So why all of a sudden have they moved to equity? The difference is the definition. Equality is equal opportunity. You know, that's fair. Equity is an equal outcome. Hmm. So that means uh, they want to uh, redistribute. That's another word for redistribution. Another one is big. The Democrats like big government and bigger, and you're seeing it right now, but not family farms that try to make ends meet using economies of scale. You know, big is bad, I'm telling you. If you're big, they're going the other way, you know, with your policy. Uh, on the tax situation that Mr. Arrington talked about, They'll say it out loud. They want to soak the rich. Now let's look. Higher individual rates for those uh, with income over 400000 Higher corporate taxes from the current 21% to 28%. Higher estate and capital gains taxes that Mr. Arrington talked about. If you want a recession in agriculture, that'll give it to you right there if they do that. Uh, you know, capital gains taxes, not just in the rural sector, but across all investors. I personally don't think that's going to happen because there'll be a bipartisan push against that when, when, when it really gets debated on it. I hope I'm right. Possible elimination of stepped-up basis. Ooh. Again, Mr. Arrington talked about it. Major implications. Farm Bureau, on Farm Bureau's site, has an excellent it's their, their leaving top economist, John Newton's last column that he's written. I would, I would read that and keep it handy when the debate happens because, you know, Farm Bureau did the ag sector a good service by that column alone because it pointed out consequences if stepped-up basis is lost. Uh, Demo but all this was big as bad, but the Democrats want to return the SALT deduction to help high-income earners in blue states, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, and California. So isn't that interesting? 
There, there's a point of demarcation. Infrastructure. It's easier to define what is not included by the term now. They throw everything in now. Not just you know, roads and bridges, you know, that, that Mr. Arrington said, the traditional infrastructure, but they have a new term now they use is social infrastructure. You see how the words are getting very important. You know, you basically eradicated the, the uh, bull weevils, but you've got woke infestation going on in your area right now, if you don't know it, okay? This is major stuff. Now, after elections, you know, we had a trifecta where the Democratic Party, in this case, won control of the White House, House, and Senate. Now, the Republicans had that before, and when that happens, this is how Obama got his Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, if you will, and how Trump got his tax cuts. It's easier to get major changes when you control all levers. Now, Biden is going even a lot faster than anyone realizes. Why is that? They know internally they're very likely to lose the House, if not the Senate. And they have about a year and a half, a year and a half in his first two years, to really get a lot of things done from their perspective. So that's why he's being very bold, very early for his agenda. There's a buzzword, I don't like to get too wonky on you, budget reconciliation. That's defined as you just need 51 votes. You can't filibuster a budget reconciliation bill that you would need 60 votes. And that's how they got the $1.9 trillion in recently. That's how they're going to get the infrastructure bill perhaps done through reconciliation. So when you hear that term, that's a procedural process to get 50 plus one. And in that case, they would have the plus one, you know, with the vice president breaking all ties. In this case, Kamala Harris. Now the Biden White House uh, executive orders. We saw President Obama use a lot of executive orders when he was president. We saw Trump do it, and Biden is doing it on steroids, okay? It's not the weight of a law. That's why I always like to see changes done codified into law. But since we can uh, get very few things done in Congress, no matter what your political perspective is, they've gone the executive authority route. But now we're going to have court actions. When Trump was president, you saw attorney generals take a lot of his policies to court. You're seeing the same thing now with attorney generals from uh, Republican-leaning states take Biden's executive orders to court. More regulations. I think they're going to attempt to return to the waters of the U.S. rule. I think the courts will you know, more than likely deny them that but I think they're gonna take another run at it. And watch the Clean Air Act rules to limit CO2 emissions. So we're gonna go back to the regulatory process. Issues, I'm gonna you know, very briefly go through COVID-19, infrastructure, healthcare, immigration, and voter registration. Voter registration is key. It's HR 1 bill in the House and S1 in the Senate. And that's the Democrats' game plan to have uh, almost permanent control of Washington by federalizing elections and taking away states' rights. That's how I analyze it. Uh, and uh, they know they want a power grab right now. And uh, they figure that if they can change the voter registrations, it'll increase the likelihood that they'll remain in power. That's that bottom line stuff. And that's why it's important to agriculture that you need a balanced policy. I don't like when Republicans and administrations are in all the time. I don't like when Democrat administrations in on time. You need checks and balances, but we don't have that yet. Other issues, farm and food, uh, farm and food nutrition policy I'll go through, trade, tax, energy, and climate change, okay? Now, Biden's cabinet, I'm not going to go through them all, but the biggies. Treasury Secretary, USDA, and the U.S. Trade Rep. Janet Yellen is the Treasury Secretary. 
Uh, she was a farmer fed chairwoman, so she's pretty smart. She's a woman who's made it in Washington, and Washington still is a sexist town, let me tell you that. She's one sharp cookie, if I can even use that term anymore with a lady, okay? She's pretty smart, okay? Now, uh, she knows what the Federal Reserve wants. I personally think the Federal Reserve is getting too cozy, you know, with the Biden administration, and that could come back to haunt us in the future. We had the producer price index come out today, 1% uh, growth. Uh, was about double than what the trade expected, giving the initial indications that inflation is on the rise. And if that continues, the Fed is going to be wrong, and they're going to have to increase interest rates, not this year, uh, next year, maybe once or twice, because that's what the futures market is signaling right now. Now, uh, Tom Vilsack returns as USDA secretary. He was the Ag Secretary uh, under the Obama administration for eight years. Now, he was making about, when you talk about his benefits at this uh, you know, dairy group, of, of about a million dollars. Now, why did he come back? You know, uh, not that money is everything, almost, but it's not everything, okay? But why did he come back? Now, he told us in an AgriTalk interview that he turned down Biden the first time he called. And uh, finally, he said yes. Why did he say yes? We had to go to a commercial break before he answered, and we didn't come back to the uh, you know, uh, answer. But sources tell me it was two things. He was given uh, a pretty good uh, free reign on climate change as it impacts the ag sector, and two, his working on the equity issues relative to selected farmer minorities. And that key word is selected, okay? Remember I said that. Those two things brought him back because in his first term as USDA, his major sin, and because he was overall a very good secretary for seven out of the eight years, his first year, he really wasn't a production agriculture secretary, and he learned some lessons right away. Uh, but Shirley Sherrod, remember Shirley Sherrod? He fired her be, uh, until a full description of what she said to a newscaster was known, and then he had had to admit he made a mistake. So I think that's in his gut to go back not only to that, but now he's got uh, the Washington in place that he really wanted during the entire term of the Obama administration. What did I just say? His first year out of his eight years under Obama, Pro Farmer, we criticized him because his first year he emphasized the 80% of uh, farmers who only produce 20% of the crop. And then his seven remaining years, he switched and focused on the 20% of production agriculture that produces 80% of the production. So big wasn't bad then. It was the efficient you know, producer. Which Vilsack are we gonna see this time? His, in early, his initial indications is he's back to that focusing on the small to medium producer. Not that there's anything wrong with being small or medium producer, but at the detriment of the larger, usually more efficient operations, okay? Now, you'll always look at the key, you know, deputy secretary and undersecretaries under agriculture, and deputy secretary is Jewel Bronow. Uh, she's an African-American, comes from my new home state of Virginia now. She knows agriculture. She was a farmer state executive director of FSA, and so I know she knows you know, farm programs if you, if you have come throughout the FSA system. She's been on the education front at, at Virginia State University. Uh, and I bring her up because either her or Robert Bonney is the deputy uh, you know, chief of staff 
If you ever have an opportunity to read about him or listen to him, do so, because he's an up-and-comer, and he's the expert that Vilsack taps for climate change as it affects agriculture. So you've got to sit up and take notice. I personally think that, uh, you know, Vilsack is going to be a transition secretary. I think Biden has another, quote, higher role for him somewhere in the administration. That's my gut, you know, telling me that. Watch your other, other USDA undersecretaries, you know, the old Bill Northey spot at the, you know, the Farm Production FSA, et cetera. Uh, Mike Schmidt is the acting right now. Now, I bring him up because he's been transferred from Debbie Stabenow's office. She's the Senate Ag Committee chairwoman. So some of these uh, recent announcements on, on CFAP, or PAP as they call it now, is kind of being directed by Mike Schmidt and by Debbie Stabenow. I said that, 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 that says a lot right there. Now here's what you don't hear probably from anybody else. The Senate Ag, Ag Committee, specifically some of uh, you know, Stabenow's staff, uh, they don't cotton to cotton producers that much, I'll tell you that. The only thing they're familiar about is cotton is when Michigan State University plays in the Cotton Bowl, okay? Be aware of that. Now, I'm not saying Debbie Stabenow is not effective. Uh, she is. She usually gets what she wants. So, got to find some way to win her over, okay? It's, it's going to be hard. Catherine Tai, U.S. Trade Representative, Mr. Arrington said that. She speaks Mandarin Chinese. She's got bipartisan support, by the way, which is rare in the Disneyland of the East, the town I love and hate at the same time, okay? Uh, she was a former deputy in the U.S. Trade Rep's office under several administrations. She was a principal writer of the language in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement specifically as it pertains to environmental and labor provisions. She is very articulate and very smart, and her forte is enforcement of existing trade agreements. So, you know, she comes with a pretty good pedigree. Michael Regan is the EPA administrator, uh, headed up North Carolina's uh, uh, EPA. Uh, the ag groups have been pretty positive towards him because his history shows that he'll at least listen. He's not an ideologue, that he's more practical. Gosh, we haven't seen that at EPA, you know, recently, over both administrations recently. So, let's hope that's the case. Uh, energy and climate uh, change. I have never seen in my over 40 years of covering, you know, Washington, one issue being mentioned by every cabinet person when they were introduced to the public. So this is a whole of government, is what Biden likes to say, a whole of government approach to a topic. So other than the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, this is their number one issue that they're gonna wrap a lot of things through. Today, the White House released Biden's first uh, broad outlines of his first budget. Uh, in there, they emphasized three topics, climate change, education, and health care. So that shows you, you always look at where their money is going. And USDA got an increase of $3.8 billion, primarily for climate change. So that tells you where they're going. Now, the budget has to be approved, but that's the earmark. You don't have to do any study on it. Follow the money, okay? Now, personnel are important. John Kerry, former Secretary of State, is the international climate change czar. Uh, Gina McCarthy, you remember her as the EPA administrator under President Obama. She used to love the uh, stick rather than the carrot, okay? She doesn't have a pretty good pedigree in the ag sector, let me tell you. Uh, she's writing a, behind the scenes a lot of the climate change proposals that's coming out 
of the Biden administration. She's the domestic one that all the cabinet people have to go through. So she's an important gatekeeper. Uh, Michael Regan, I've already mentioned EPA, and Jennifer uh, Granholm used to be Michigan's uh, governor. She knows automobiles, she should know uh, energy. Now, biofuels role in climate efforts. Finally, I think the biofuel lobbyists are thinking smart. I don't think they've had the best lobbyists, to tell you the truth, in Washington. Uh, they've been defeated in a number of, uh, of areas. And now they're wising up. They're saying, you know, we got a low carbon fuel standard we can do in the higher octane, the E15, E20. The sweet spot is E25 and E30. Watch them bridge that into the climate change debate and uh, the reworking of the renewable fuel standard because the authorization for that ends in 2022. So a lot of important changes are going to go on there. Now, uh, you know, Biden can do a lot on, on climate change through executive action, and he already has. Regulations, legislation is gonna have to be needed. What about this ag carbon bank, you know, that you keep hearing about? It's mostly uh, the details are fuzzy because there's no details, you know? I can't write a special report on climate change on might be this, might be that. They don't know yet, they don't know. Now the ag groups sense a big potential revenue stream ahead. I don't blame them, potential. But remember the ag sector, uh, thankfully, helped defeat the carbon tax a few years ago. Now they want a seat at the table, which they should, because why? Trillions of dollars are going to be spent on climate change. And we'll see which way. But what farmers and, and ranchers tell, uh, you know, you know pro-farmer is this, relative to, you know, climate change and ag sector. One, it should be uh, voluntary, not mandatory. Two, it should include payments to the legacy farmers and ranchers who did things uh, that new entrants in practices uh, will get a payment for. Uh, you know, such as, uh, uh, you know, no-till, et cetera. So those are legacy costs. Farm state lawmakers know that. I, I bet Mr. Arrington has heard this from, you know, your producers as well. And then they want to know how is carbon going to be measured and how is it going to be priced? Uh, those are all questions right now. Now my next uh, uh, calendar shot that I'm waiting for is April 22nd, that's Earth Day. Now Biden is big on days, you know, that's Earth Day. Now I know they're working with USDA, Robert, Bonnie, et cetera. What type of big announcement for USDA and climate change could they announce on Earth Day to be determined? But at least I've told you what to watch out for. Okay, if you hear about it, let me know, okay? They may release a series of principles, general, general things that they feel is going to come down. Uh, as far as that uh, carbon bank, uh, there's a thing at USDA called the Commodity Credit Corporation, CCC, Charter Act. Now, just a few years ago, people such as myself and Colin Peterson, House Ag Committee, and other wonks who like foreign policy, we talked about it, but it made your, you know, eyes glaze over. But now, since Trump tapped that for a significant portion of the CFAP payment funding, not all, a significant portion, all lawmakers, both political parties, see that as an ATM machine. Ooh, let, let's go get some money for this purpose and that purpose. Now, it's funded at $30 billion and it's reauthorized, you know, to do the cap. Now, what I think they're going to do is eventually put another 20 to $30 billion for the borrowing authority for the CCC, from 30 to up to 60 billion, but use a big portion of that for climate change and conservation programs, perhaps putting in that as a higher baseline for the new farm bill. Now that's speculation at this point, but watch that development potentially play out. Uh, 
USDA is trying to figure out what to do on carbon sequestration. They, they don't know yet. This is so complex, you know? Uh, pilot programs are likely. Now, in my the dinner you know, conversation with Ronnie Jackson last night, it was very interesting, I must admit. He's, pretty, he's uh, innovative, let me tell you. Uh, I told him one of the secrets, he asked me, what have you learned covering Washington for over 40 years? I said, you want the secrets of the tomb? He said, yeah, pilot programs is the way to go. And Farm Bill, if, if you're in a county or district or whatever you call them here, uh, I know they call them something in Louisiana, they call it parishes. Uh, see, whenever I go to Louisiana, I always learn again, while I can drink with a Cajun, I can't keep drinking with a Cajun. You, know, you learn that every time you go. But I told him, I said, if you're in a county and you really want something, but you can't get enough votes to get it, have your lawmaker do it as a pilot program in any legislation, but definitely the Farm Bill. And he said, why is that? I said, there's a budget angle to that. The Congressional Budget Office, which is the official scorekeeper of Washington, of Congress, does not score pilot programs for a long-term duration. They don't know it's a pilot program. So it goes unscored. So just a little tidbit for you. And I gave to Ronnie Jackson because it looks like he's going to be a mover and shaker in the years ahead. I gave him some other ones, but I can't remember them what they are right now. I told him CCC Charter Act. That's a, uh, you know, uh, I called the White House once and said, uh, you know, Reagan ought to tap the CCC Charter Act for the Contra funding, you know. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> boosting conservation spending is coming, big time. It's coming. Uh, Biden's push for electric vehicles. Arrington mentioned this, 550,000. Now, the EVs, electric you know, vehicles, their lobbyists are smarter than the biofuel people. Why do I say that? They're working on infrastructure. Remember, we went for years in which the biofuel industry debated uh, going from E10 to E15, and they didn't have the pumps out, they didn't have the tanks ready, okay? And EVs are going to come. Now, I almost got a Tesla, you know? Uh, but a couple neighbors had them, and they told me that they loved them, but when something went wrong, they had to wait a few days to get it fixed. Well, I don't like that. I'm your average American. I got to have it done today, okay? So I backed off. But I'm a lover of cars. What did I like about EVs? It pushes your head back when you're at the red light and it turns green, the, the, the power of an EV car. So what did I buy just a month ago? I bought a Hyundai SUV because it had three, 311 torque on a SUV, turbo. I said, I don't need an EV, you know? And it gets better mileage than my other SUV had. So there's a lot of progress still going on in combustible engine. Bottom line, uh, the, com the, the uh, gasoline, yeah, it has peaked in use. The RFS, the Renewable Fuel Standard, is based on miles driven. That has to change if you're an ethanol you, you, you proponent uh, because we're going to continue to go down as we have more hybrid cars and EVs. So that's why the biofuel industry is going to have to have a, a new strategy on that one. And I'm a history major, and I went back and looked back of how many years did it take to really move from the horse and buggy days to the Fords, okay? And it was about 20 years before it first started. So we've got another 15 to 20 years because now we're efficient, we're getting more efficient in those batteries, and that'll continue. Never bet against the ingenuity of American, you know, you know, you know technology, okay? You know, Tesla shows you that, and they're gonna get better and better. So about 15 to 20 years. That doesn't mean that 
the gasoline and diesel cars are going to go poof. No, there's too many cars on the road, and they're going to continue to increase in technology, but it's going to be an amalgamation you know, for that uh, industry. Now, RFS, I've already talked about that, but you can study this. I want to save a little time here. There's a number of decisions that's going to be, have to be made. But what the uh, Biden administration is waiting for is the Supreme Court is going to hear the case April 27th on the small refinery exemption ruling by the Tenth Circuit Court. And that's, once we know that, that's going to uh, unleash a number of other decisions by the Environmental Protection uh, Agency. And EPA has been asked to study whether electronic vehicles charging could generate the RINs. So there, this is from a market perspective that people are already thinking ahead of where the EVs are going to impact the RIN markets. I mentioned the authorization for RFS expires in 2022, and that debate is already beginning. Uh, Vilsack, I mentioned before, this is a changed Vilsack now. Uh, his first interview early in his new tenure, he said these are, are the issues that are top of his agenda in which he called a very active and proactive USDA. COVID relief, equity and inclusion, there's that word again, climate and regenerative agriculture, rural economic development, nutrition security and assistance, open and competitive markets, USDA employee morale, because he thinks it went down under the Trump administration, and forest service management in an era of climate-driven wildfires. There's his agenda right there. And he's very focused. I mean, he's a very sharp guy, lawyer by training, okay? Uh, he was an orphan who was picked up on the steps of a Catholic church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you don't know his story, he tells it a lot. And why he's so interested in nutrition, by the way, is growing up, let's just say he was a chubby boy. And his adopted parents uh, put pictures of fat boys on the refrigerator. So it's ingrained in him literally on food and nutrition. So in that area, you're not going to change him. It's passion to him, okay? Now, the Biden administration, I've said before, and I'll say it again, look at their appointments because I think that says a lot. I think Vilsack is probably not choosing his uh, you know, sub-cabinet like he did under the Obama administration. They're being chosen for him, okay? National Farmers Union gains clout, usually in a Democratic administration, but is it just that they're going to support everything that the Biden and USDA does? I, I think it's fair to ask that question. Ag panels, are they bipartisan? Uh, I guess mainly so, but boy, there's some fractures lately. Uh, you got to watch the appropriations committees. That's where the action's going to be, and that's very partisan right now. The next farm bill, not this year. No matter what you may or hear, they're not going to do much because the Republicans sense that they're going to win the House and maybe win back the Senate. So they don't want to do too much on a farm bill. Okay? They'll have field hearings or they'll have a look back hearings on the current farm bill, and they should. Crop insurance, the best risk management tool I've ever seen in my career in, in covering agriculture. Hopefully they won't foul that up. Okay? There's still bipartisan support for crop insurance because it's food insurance to a lawmaker who really knows that. Uh, but losing Pat Roberts, you know, on retirement, Senate Ag Committee Chairman, Mike Conaway, I don't have to tell you Mike Conaway, and Colin Peterson. That's almost 85 years of collective career history. You don't replace that right away. So now we have a new, a new order, and I'm going to go through some of them. Watch this equity review when it comes to crop insurance. I don't think they're going to do anything but boy, they're going to take a look at the data in crop insurance to see if there's any bias, okay? 
appropriations is always an area you look, you look out for silly amendments on, on crop insurance. The next farm bill, there'll be some you know, amendments offered. And debt reduction ahead. Uh, you're not gonna have debt reduction for the next minimum two years. And in, you know, Republicans in the Trump administration, they didn't mention debt hardly at all, you know? So both, both sides are spending money more than a drunken sailor, and that's an understatement, okay? Modern monetary theory is what it's called. Just print whatever you want. Just, and that's where we're at right now. The only editor Congress has is the bond market. If the bond market thinks that Washington has lost control, it's not there yet, uh, your, inter your real interest rates are gonna go up higher faster than anyone realizes, but we're at least a few years you know, from that. I mentioned CCC Charter Act. Uh, on food policy, food stamps, it's interesting that the Democrats have really put in huge amounts of more funding for food stamps in the, in the CPAP bills. So I, I don't see how they could add even hardly any more money into that program. I mean, it's really top heavy in food stamp funding. Labeling issues are always important when the Democrats come in. So the food industry is a little nervous of what they're gonna recommend. A mandatory country of origin labeling will at least, you know, you know, Vilsack has said he'll take another look at that, but there's always potential World Trade Organization problems. Antitrust review. This is a big one for the Biden administration because Vilsack is creating an antitrust task force in the agriculture and food processing industry. And I'll let you read, you know, those bullets. But here's the bottom line. I see them taking a significant look at potential antitrust issues in the seed industry and in the meat processing industry. That's what they tell me are going to be the two topics they're going to look at relative to the ag sector, okay? Uh, now important lawmakers in the House, moderate Republicans and uh, the far left Democrats. Now, notice much of the press, if not all of the press, call far left Democrats progressives. You know, you've heard that term, right? I won't, I won't take the bait on that. That's just a decoy because the Democrats did not like the word far left Democrats, okay? Uh, so both of those are important in the House, why? Because Nancy Pelosi can only lose two votes amongst the Democrats, and if she loses more than two, she needs some Republican votes. So she's gonna to have to cater to AOC and the other far left Democrats, and or get some moderate you know, Republicans. Now in the Senate, you know, most people mentioned you know, Manchin from West Virginia, a moderate. Uh, Coons from Delaware is really Biden's point man because he comes from his, quote, home state, of Delaware, and he's going to negotiate and be a close contact. So when you hear what, you know, Coons says, listen up. So, you know, Cinema was mentioned from Arizona, uh, and uh, Tester from Montana is a populist. You never which, know which way he's going to go on issues. On the Republican side, Senator uh, Susan Collins from Maine, Murkowski from uh, Alaska, and Romney from Utah are the ones that the White House will usually go for to see if they need any Republican votes. Now the Republican senators up for re-election in 2020, 20 versus 14 for Democrats. So they'll probably look at those 20 up to see if they can uh, you know, get them to vote a certain way, okay? Now, you know, filibuster, elimination. Biden and a number of other Democrats have talked out loud about either modifying the filibuster or eliminating it. And the filibuster is just, you know, you need 60 votes on most legislation to stop debate, okay? Now, uh, the keys to this, Manchin said just the other day in the Washington Post op-ed column, he is totally against eliminating the you know, filibuster, and he does not want to modify it. So that should be the death knell for that, but certain lawmakers change their position. 
you know? Uh, you know, Cinema is another one who says, no, we do need checks and balances. We need bipartisanship. Now, if the filibuster would end some aggressive Democrats, it would be one party rule. They would, they would at least push for statehood for the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Now, I think there's constitutional problems in DC statehood, but not that they care about that anymore. And, and, and Puerto Rico, at least three, if not four, of those potential senators would easily be Democrats, okay? So there's justification here of why the Democrats are doing what they do. And you saw they would want to pack the Supreme Court. Again, I think it's unlikely because they would need uh, Manchin and Cinnamon's vote and they're not gonna get it on that. But they're still upset at Trump and the way he unfolded uh, uh, the Supreme Court. So that's why they wanna add four more you know, Supreme Court justices, at least a growing number of Democrats do. You've seen some issues on gun control. You know, Biden yesterday uh, released some executive orders, but he really needs legislation changes to get what they want on, uh, on gun control. I don't think it'll happen. Labor union bills, they undermine state right to work laws. I think you'd see a push for that if the filibuster would end. You'd have immigration reform the way the Democrats would want it, okay? Uh, and voter registration, that's the HR1 and S1, you know, that I talked about. Now, even if the filibuster is eliminated, if the Senate Republicans hold together and prevents a quorum, okay, they need 51 without Vice President Harris. I've already looked into this. Now, Schumer, as majority leader, could compel the sergeant at arms to produce senators if they do not show. In other words, haul them in. You've seen this at some states. I think Wisconsin had it a few years. You know, Texas, oh, you had it, so you know. I can't rule anything out in DC right now. I've gotta be ready, you know? Uh, GOP senators would have to go into hiding. So, you know, oh, this would be a field day for the cable stations. I mean, can you imagine? You know, they play hide and seek, oh my God. Rachel Manow on the prowl, oh God. It could bring the Senate to a total standstill. Don't, that, that might be a plus, okay? But don't say, I didn't warn you, okay? Now, infrastructure plus. Reconciliation is gonna be used, only 50 votes needed. Can Democrats hold their ranks? Again, Manchin's gonna to have to be dealt with, cinema. Uh, $2.25 trillion, that's only part one of two parts. You know, when I first came to town, millions of dollars was the term in legislation. Then it became billions, and now it's trillions. That's called inflation, you know, government-wise. What's for ag and rural America in this package, okay? Is it really gonna help narrow the rural-urban divide? Uh, it looks like rural housing, telemedicine, broadband, rural electrics, rural water, and sewer, when I, when I go through the numbers. The investment in some rural highways, roads, and, and bridges versus urban. Yeah, we desperately need an infrastructure bill, uh, definitely. So let's hope that they'll get e as some part of infrastructure because the great country needs it. Social infrastructure is, uh, included in this, but even more in part two to come, which will be almost another $2 trillion that he's gonna debut uh, sometime in May, okay? Uh, part two is tax policy to help pay for the infrastructure. So you see how these things are tied together, of how they're trying to group all this together in order to justify policy. Now in the Senate agenda, the Georgia races was key. And my analysis shows that uh, Trump helped defeat the two uh, uh, Georgia Republicans uh, the, from you know, you know, some of his actions. Uh, Stabenow is the, returns as the chair of the Ag Panel. Bernie Sanders, the socialist at the Budget Committee. Isn't that ironic to have a socialist to head up the Senate Budget Committee? I mean, talk about an oxymoron. Widen at finance. 
Now, I always like to bring up finance because much like Mr. Arrington told you, the reason he chose ways and means was because what he said, stepped up basis and all tax writing stuff, trade policy goes through the finance committee in the Senate and the ways and means in the House. 60% or more of all important legislation goes through those two panels. So I think he had a pretty good justification. Brown, you know, Sherrod Brown from Ohio is at banking and Durbin from Illinois is at judiciary. Their focus in the Senate echoes just what the White House wants climate change, transportation, infrastructure, and health care. Now the Republicans, the ranking member is Bozeman from uh, Arkansas. He, he knows that, you know, anybody who chairs a committee, if they're from the South, they know that they have to talk with and deal with uh, people in the mid I states and northern tier states to get anything done. He knows this, and he's bipartisan. He's a pretty good guy. Grassley, Senator Chuck Grassley, Republican from Iowa, is timed off the Finance Committee, and now we have Mike Crape, Crapel from Idaho, you have to be careful how you pronounce that, uh, It's the new ranking uh, member. So listen to what he says as well, especially in the tax area. Now the House, smallest control, you know, you know margin of control, since 1945. That was even before I was born. Now that's old, you know? Uh, 218 to 212 right now is, is the margin. Two votes. She can lose two Democrats only. The end of the band on earmarks in the House? Yes. What, what are earmarks? They got rid of them, I think, in 2011 under John Bader, Republican from Ohio, when the Republicans controlled the chamber and earmarks is when they allowed certain lawmakers to target, to specify funding, usually in a transportation and infrastructure spending bill, to a certain district, county, or state. And frankly, I thought that they threw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think this is a return to more power for Congress and less power for the White House. The Senate is eventually going to be pressured to follow. You've probably heard and read about PAYGO, in which certain bills uh, have to be offset their spending by cuts elsewhere. Now, again, I don't want to get too wonky on you. They, they did end PAYGO in the House for COVID relief, climate change, and infrastructure. That tells you their priorities again. But you know, they need a waiver bill. Uh, Biden's going to have to sign a, a waiver bill uh, for statutory PAYGO uh, to avoid big cuts in Medicare and farm programs. And he will. I mean, this, the town loves to spend money, both parties, and the White House. So don't get too upset about this. It's going to be waived, okay? If somebody tries to scare you, just, you know, you, you know give them my email. Uh, Texas loss of power in the House. In the House, Ag Committee. No West Texan. Long time since that was the case. Now, Ronnie Jackson told me last night that he's got the commitment that, uh, he didn't say if, he said when the Republicans regain the House, uh, he'll go on the House Ag Committee because they'll have additional members uh, available. So he's going to come back on. Uh, I thought it was very important when Vela decision not to chair, to retire, because he could have chaired this, uh, an important subcommittee. That said a lot to me right there. So there's no Democrat on the panel. From my recollection, uh, Michael Cloud is the only Republican on the panel. He's from Corpus. Help me out here, I think. He's from Corpus. Now, silver lining. Frank Lucas from Oklahoma used to be the House Ag Committee chairman in the writing of one of the Farm Bills 2014. Uh, says he's going to get back on the co committee in time for the next Farm Bill. Now, he's not from your home state of Texas, but he knows your issues. And he's astute and he's a cooperator. So I think that's a good sign, you know, for the future. The addition of Colin Peterson to the Combest Cell a uh, consulting group, you know, advocate group, you know, for the ag sector is important to West Texas in my judgment. We had a long interview with, uh, you know, Colin Peterson 
uh, my podcast, you know, you know Signal to Noise, where 99% of the stuff out of Washington is noise, okay? So I go for that 1% signal. But that whole program was 100% signal because Colin just really laid out what had happened and what will happen in the next few years. Go, you know, Google signal to noise and, uh, you know, listen to that. Uh, Thompson is the ranking on the, uh, on the House Ag Committee. He's supportive to production agriculture, even though he comes from uh, Pennsylvania. We've had him several times on AgriTalk. David Scott is chair from Georgia. He's good friends with Austin Scott. Uh, but uh, I will tell you, David Scott is very different. Uh, first black American ever to chair the House Ag Committee. And I mean, you talk about focus on uh, socially disadvantaged farmers, our selected minorities. He's just really focused on that. Uh, Sanford Bishop, an appropriation subcommittee chairman, is a pretty good lawmaker and he's bipartisan. You can work with him. You can work with him. Now, ag appropriations, more food stamp funding, I don't think any is needed. Watch amendments. Bozeman is ranking on agriculture. Uh, and Hoven, you know, John Hoven is ranking on appropriations and both of them uh, are very good for production agriculture and know your issues. So you always got to have effective people on the ranking side as well. Now, CFAP. I'm going to let you study those, but uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. But I will tell why did it take almost three months for, for those announcements to be made? You know? Uh, it was because when Biden won, Stabenow's office contacted the White House and said, have Vilsack review uh, this unspent money and see if it should be redirected to certain areas. And that's really what happened. Now, uh, we have what we call CPAP AA, additional aid. Processing of some applications are currently underway. Then they have PAP, which is an odd acronym, but PAP, uh, they, 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 it's a new effort, but still to be detailed is at least $6 billion in payments for several commodity sectors, including biofuels. So biofuels is finally going to get some funding. I think for pumps and things like that, infrastructure. Textile mills, you're gonna get $80 million. We have to see the details, okay? Uh, still unknown is payments for contract growers. Now, pay caps, this is important for this country. Purdue, when he was Ag Secretary under Trump, he provided a payment limit for CFAP 1 and a separate limit for CFAP 2. That was very good to the livestock industry especially, who bump up against those caps, and uh, more than a few cotton producers, I would think. Uh, but then Vilsack put the new PAP payments under the same limit as CFAP 2. In other words, no increase. So if tapped out under CFAP 2, there's no new aid under PAP. And they saved that money. They estimated how I think it saved five or six hundred million dollars, and they moved it to their favored sectors. This is how what happened and why. Now, if not tapped up, out under CFAP two, PAP payments may still be reduced if those CFAP two and PAP payments taken together exceed the single limit. So there's constraints under how much money is provided to larger producers. Okay, there's the signal. Payment, okay, now this is a sensitive issue to many people. Uh, payments and aid to selected minority farmers by ethnic group. Now, this doesn't include a minority white female farmer. Not included, okay? Now, in that bill, in the $1.9 trillion package, Congress included $4 billion uh, in a 120% debt relief payment that if a selected farmer, let's just take for example a black farmer, had a loan out uh, that was guaranteed by USDA, either directly or guaranteed through uh, a private bank, 
they get 120% payoff. And that extra 20% is to pay the taxes on that uh, income. Now, the Congressional Budget Office scored this, and it's going to be a huge potential payment for each uh, farmer that uh, is, quote, eligible for this. You don't have to prove discrimination here, by the way. Uh, going to get a huge payment. I tried to remember what it was. It's either, I know it's over $100,000, and it could be over 200000 but here's the kicker. I always go back to funding sources, and the language for this says, see, I put $4 billion, and that's what everybody will tell you, but the language says such sums as necessary. That means it could be $5 billion, it could be $6 billion or more. Now, the black farmer lobbyist in Washington called this a down payment. This is just a, a chit. They're going to go after a lot more money. And you're seeing individual states do reparation payments. I don't think there's any other way to put it. Now, there was a Republican bill to deal with the discrimination against others. That's going to go nowhere in the Democratic-controlled Congress. But is there going to be a challenge in the court coming from, say, a a white producer? And that's going to be an interesting test case on this. The Supreme Court has ruled remedial relief to remedy past harm is okay if racially based. I went and looked at the you know, scripture there. The outlook, what's going to come up in new legislation is a push to purchase and redistribute federal lands to black farmers. So that's going to increase here in the focus. I personally think that the Democrats were really scared when Trump made inroads in the minority community in the votes. You could see it in the numbers. You know, you remember when Trump said, you have been voting for Democrats for 60 years. What have they done for you? That got Democrats nervous. That's why you're seeing some of this action, for sure. Now, whip plus. Timing, when will second half of 2019 crop payments uh, be made, or, and will they be made? This has been the poorest operated USDA program I've seen in my career. They held it off, they, they, they had this silly rule that uh, no more than 25% of an FSA office could be manned at one time, uh, uh, you know, could be employed at one time, you can't say manned. Uh, now. Uh, and now they recently changed that to 50%, okay? You go through drive through windows. So that was part of the problem there. Uh, the quality loss adjusted payments. Uh, you know, Arrington said, you know, correctly, the sign-up ends for that. So we're going to get some information now on uh, whether all those, uh, you know, second half 2019 WIP payments are going to be made. And Senator John Thune, call up AgriTalk from yesterday. We interviewed John Thune, and he talked about all these subjects. And he said, once they know how, mu how many farmers are dealing with, both in QLA and, and, and the uh, you know, personnel in the offices, they'll be able to calculate uh, if they need any additional funding, which was a signal they might provide additional funding for WIP Plus. And then you have, uh, you know, you know, Ronnie uh, you know, Jackson and a couple of others are pushing WIP Plus for 2020 crop and 2021 you know, potential disasters. So we're, a lot more is to happen in, in, in this one. Key economic issues, now I'm going to rat-a-tat-tat because I want to be at least a little on time. Vaccine implementation is the key. That's driving this whole country right now. I'll tell you, when I came to lunch with uh, you know, Dr. Verrett yesterday, it was the first time I saw a whole restaurant without any mask. <laughs> you know, I felt like I was a sin. I thought I had to go to confession, you know? I mean, it was a breath of fresh air. Boy, did I eat, you know? Uh, and then, uh, you know, in where I live in DC, you know, the only time you had freedom from the mask is when you went to uh, bars, you know, and you could take it off to drink, and I got drunk every night, you know, just from not wanting to wear a mask, you know. So now, boy, I could, I could have fun down here. Uh, bottom line, you can feel it. We're back. We're getting back. Jaron, I-N-G. We're coming back. And the markets knows this. 
your 401k should be 501k, maybe 601k, et cetera. The savings rate is a lot higher. There's $1.9 trillion more in savings over the past year because Americans couldn't spend it, you know? Don't ever, don't ever remodel a kitchen in a pandemic year. I'm trying to. I finally, after five months, got most of the appliances that I wanted, okay? Five months. But this fall, I think we're gonna see an unleashing of a lot of, lot of supplies. Why? Monetary central bank policy remains favorable around the globe. World economic growth, IMF, just earlier this week, 6% growth in 2021, you know, this year. Why is that important? You cotton people uh, should know this. World economic growth is important because the ability to buy. So Merrill Oster at Pro Farmer many years ago taught us that if your world economy's growth is at least 4.5% or more, you have the potential for demand pull markets. And that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, if the vaccine is widespread, uh, growing again, look, it's world, U.S. and China, and U.S. and China are clearly leading the world. There are some people in developing countries, some countries, developing countries, and Europe is not growing as fast. Okay? And you can go through the numbers individually by you know, country and how important they are to cotton. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have time to study you know, that one. U.S. economy, growth rate, IMF said 6.4% in 2021. I think it could actually be 7%. That's what's driving the, you know, the, uh, uh, the stock markets. Uh, jobless rate is going to trend down. I think it'll be just over 5% end of this year, but that's still millions of people unemployed. 10-year Treasury yield, I think, is going to end the year 1.8%. It's about 1.65% now. Mortgage rates are going to rise to 3.5% or higher. We've seen the lows, okay? If you try to buy a house right now, you're probably going to be bid out of it. Now, that's usually the signs of a top for me. I've seen two tops in my life, two big tops, and I, I don't know how close we are to a top in the housing market, but to me, I think it's getting closer. It's getting silly, you know? When you bid for a house that lists for 700000 I had my nephew tell me this. Hey, he must be doing quite well. He's trying to buy a house on, on the Ozarks along the lake. Listed for 700000 he and his partner bid 825000 and got bumped out of it. Talk about a hot market. That's a hot market, okay? I told him, you better be careful. <laughs> you better be careful. Now, inflation is on the rise, but the Fed's saying transitory. Transitory. They're going to let it run above their 2% target, which is not close yet. Watch the U.S. dollar and the bond market. Almost every analyst I consulted earlier this year said the dollar is going to trend lower. Of course, they were wrong. It's trended higher. So if the dollar keeps going up, that's telling me future traders are signaling we're going to have higher interest rates sooner than what the Fed is saying, and we'll have higher interest rates relative to Europe, so it'll support the dollar. Okay. Uh, so also watch the bond market. Agriculture now is next. Uh, working capital, we reached a peak in 2012, and then we've gone down every year since where it got down to the core. We were getting down to very nervous areas here last year. Then we got the turnaround in prices, but you don't solve a problem in one year. We need multiple years here. I'm not gonna go through all, but we're in a fledgling bull market in corn and soybeans. Uh, cotton. Uh, I think once they see the total production, if this drought continues, uh, that's going to get the futures traders really excited and pick a number. You know, uh, I think we're in a multi-commodity bull market. You, you, you know, for this calendar year, I hope it's not drought-led. I'd rather see demand-led markets. But I will tell you this: I could spend a whole presentation on. What's going on with USDA's estimates? All my career, I have never wanted to be negative 
on USDA's estimates because they're statisticians. They want to do a good job. They don't do it on purpose. They don't do it on a political ground like uh, some charge. No way. Uh, but they miss the cotton market. I called Mr. Ferret here in, what, August last year and said, is that USDA numbers right? And as only Steve said, I couldn't report about 70% of the words that he said. He was spot on. He said they have missed this crop big time. They're too high. What's happening? They did the same thing on the corn and soybeans, not only on the production estimates, but on grain stocks. Now in corn and soybeans, we talked to NAS, you know, uh, they who make those estimates. They said the response rate for the corn and soybean estimates was 58.8% in this last report. You know what their goal is? 80%. So I think it's a combination of farmers sandbagging USDA now more than what they've done in the past. But NAS also said the I states are consistent. They don't have a problem with that because they look from year to year. Uh, he, he didn't say it, but he goes some other states. And when you look at their map, North and South Dakota and Minnesota, uh, he didn't say they lie, uh, but they do. <laughs> North Dakota lies the most on crop reports, by the way. I did ask, I found that out. But we're going to see if this theory is right because when you file what? The June report, your acreage report. Corn and soybean acres are going to go up two to three million acres from what USDA is saying. Now here's bottom line on this. I've, I've been, again, I used to be a market reporter. I've got people I've known for 30 years saying, you know, they're nervous about USDA's uh, getting behind the curve here. They need help. They need to be new methods. They're afraid that the private industry, and they're right, is getting ahead of USDA. So some big firms are contracting with remote sensing companies who can send out drones at a key production time that counts the number of uh, you know, you know, soybean pots. So you don't want that to happen. I mean, private industry, yes, so, so be it, let them go. But NAS should also be tapped into that technology as well. So bottom line, something's happened at USDA and they need to improve it. Government payments was about 40% of farm income last year. It's going to be different this year from the market. Meat processing plants are back to almost full capacity. That's good for feed markets. Food service industries is going to take longer to return. Farmland prices, much like housing prices, are on the rise. And they're, they're sensing this demand pull markets. Crop insurance guarantee, look at cotton, 83 cents. I didn't have to talk to too many of you to, to, to know that you're nervous about the rainfall or the lack of. And you know your final planting dates. And the users of cotton know them too. They're nervous uh, because that is an attractant, that 83 cents. So I just always hope for rain, just not too much of it. So hope you get it. Tax policy, I'm not going to go through. We've already talked on that. Uh, trade, I think Mr. Arrington covered that. Uh, uh, I think that we'll have a, uh, I think we're going to rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. Watch uh, the first international official uh, from another country is coming over from Japan's prime minister later this month. And Japan wants us back in to the TPP and it's going to be important to know what does Biden want to rejoin that because Congress is going to have to vote in favor of it. I think we're going to have new trade agreements with the United Kingdom and Kenya, the, trans the you know, fast track authority, trade promotion authority expires in July of this year. I think it'll eventually be renewed. Uh, that, you know, TPA is when you can uh, you know, vote on a new trade agreement up or down without any amendments. I think it will be extended, but it's going to take a few months to do that. Cuba trade policy, Biden will go the way of Obama in, in improving relations with uh, Cuba. The House Democrats are watching the USMCA relative to uh, environmental and labor issues. Future elections, just my predictions, 
uh, I think that the high odds that the, that the Republicans regain the House after 2022 uh, elections. And as far as the Senate, the numbers don't look good, you know, 20 to 14. But when you go through state by state, it's going to be very interesting to see if the Democrats overreach with some of these proposals that, you know, you know several of us have talked about. If Americans think that they've overreached, redistributing wealth, et cetera, the Democratic Party will have a price to pay. Okay. Will Tr Donald Trump run again in 2024? I'm not going to take that issue on. Okay. I'm just not going to go there. My last one, uh, I talked about HR1 and, and S1. G as if we don't have enough to worry about, I'm a Catholic Jew. I worry about everything. Okay. Uh, geopolitics. Biden's going to be tested. China? China thinks we've peaked, so they're going to consistently test Biden. Russia, Iran, and North Korea, some at the same time. More and major cyber attacks, big, big in the future. Black Swan, we didn't see COVID-19 coming. Is there another one? Civil unrest, not just in the U.S., but other countries. Senate change, a flip, a death, we're on a death watch, it's that close. Uh, Biden's health, he's older than Reagan was when Reagan left the White House. You know, uh, all great men are dead and I'm not well myself. You know, I know how I feel and he's older than I am. Uh, the last one, if African swine fever or another disease such as foot and mouth disease ever comes to North America, Canada, US or Mexico, major impacts for not only the US livestock industry but the affiliated feed industries as well. So that's on your worry list. That's why you have to have research. That's why you have good organizations to ask about these things and to monitor. Now, I think we're over, okay? We're over, but my email is on there. Email me with your particular questions that are comments that you have. But again, I want a bottom line. We are going through a major, bold, uh, hmm. Let me shut that off. Uh, attempt by a political party to dramatically change the direction of the country. I think that's a fair way to put it. How do you monitor the news? You, frequently, I've asked, you, you asked me that. There's very few news programs I would recommend to you. One is Brett Baer on Fox News, the best news program I know. Not the cable, not the cable news, not the Hannity types, et cetera, but Brett Baer's you know, special report. It's on 6 o'clock Eastern, so it's probably 5 o'clock here, and also Wall Street Journal report on the weekends, I think, is a good panel uh, area that talks about the news. Yes, from a more conservative perspective, but at least they have different perspectives on, on the program. Overall, agriculture, to me, has turned the corner, and we're now into fledgling bull markets. That's needed. It looks like the U.S. and world economy is on the roll right now, uh, but, there's, uh, but it, it, there's a price to pay maybe uh, uh, later on with all this money being thrilled, but not, by the U not only by the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve, but other central banks around the world, okay?